<laughs> well, good morning. That was half-hearted and lackluster. Let's try that again. Good morning. <laughs> that is so much better. You know, I know it was so great. Yeah, it was like Michigan monsoon yesterday. Hopefully your house didn't like wash away. Uh, but uh, it may still be a bit gray out there. But the sunshine of God's love is in this place. And I want to welcome you. And uh, especially if you're a guest or visitor, I say we are delighted that you have joined us here in this place at Lakeshore Lutheran Fellowship, as our mission is to joyfully connect people to the love of Jesus. And uh, you should have received a connection card when you came in today, and uh, please let us know if you have any prayer requests, if there's any way we can serve you, or, or if you want to get involved, and uh, you can drop those in the offering basket a little later. And um, this morning we're going to continue our series, um, Answering Objections to Christianity. So get ready for that, and as we prepare to worship, I want to invite you to stand, and just turn around, people around you, walk across the aisle if you have to, and greet one another, radiating the peace and joy of Jesus. Also, I want to greet everyone who's tuned in by live stream. Uh, it's great that you can tune in through uh, means of technology uh, this morning. And let us gather together as the baptized children of God, whom He calls and gathers in this place. I can hear everybody talking. In the name of our God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. You know, maybe you feel battle-weary. Maybe you feel battered and bruised from this past week as we struggle with fears and doubts and maybe wrestle with feeling, sinful feelings and thoughts and, and just feeling like, you know, our spiritual gas tank is on empty. We need the Lord to renew us. And we consider the words of David in Psalm 32 where he acknowledges how important it is for us to confess our sin and our need for God. Psalm 32, verse 3 says, When I kept silent, my bones wasted away as I groaned all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My moisture was dried up by the droughts of summer. But I acknowledged my sin to you. And I did not cover up my guilt. I said, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. And it's because of that promise that we come to him. And let us begin as we prepare to confess to the Lord with this confession together. We confess, holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. If you would bow your heads with me and let us take a few moments as we uh, consider those words that we spoke and ponder and meditate in our hearts where we need to make that confession to the Father. Just take a few moments and do that in a time of quiet prayer. Let's do that right now. Oh God, you are the almighty God, and you are also our heavenly Father. And we plead with you for your mercy, your grace. And Lord, where we have sinned, where we have gone astray, 
where we have not loved you and loved others as you've called us to. Renew us, strengthen us, fill us with your spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And I declare to you the mercy of your God shown in Jesus, the heart of the Father, that he loves you so much that he would give his life in death to bleed and die for your sins and mine. So that in the name of Jesus, I declare to you who have turned to him, you are forgiven. You are cleansed. You are given a new heart. And the Spirit is here to fill you, renew you, and empower you. And just as David in Psalm 32 says, how blessed is the person whose rebellion is forgiven, that is you. Whose sin is covered, how blessed is the person whose guilt the Lord does not charge against him, in whose spirit there is no deceit. This is you, as you have confessed and turned to him. And so he says, rejoice in the Lord and celebrate all you righteous and shout joyfully all you upright in heart. Amen? Let us sing our hallelujahs to the Lord this day.
turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, bending every heart. I worship you. I worship you. We make a miracle work. present in this place, a God who is here working in our midst, that Father, you are here in your Son, the Word made flesh, in the presence and power of the Spirit, you are here in our midst to work in our hearts, to bring healing to broken hearts, to mend and restore that which is broken and grieving to be restored by your redeeming love. For you are the promise keeper. And you have promised that you are with us always till the end of the age, that you will never leave nor forsake us. You are the light shining in the darkness, the one who lights the way and scatters the, all the powers of darkness and fear and doubt and worry and anxiety. You scatter with the light of your presence. And even when there feels like there is no way, like we are trapped, that we are overcome by grief and anxiety and doubts and fears. You are the way maker. You are the miracle worker. And you have made a promise to us that you are faithful. And we will follow you, Jesus, as the heart of the Father. Give us your spirit to follow you the light that you shine, knowing and trusting and believing that you will make a way where there seems to be no way. And that you will work miracles. 
Lord, when you know that we need them, and in your time and in your way, oh, Lord, may we know who you are as our God and who we are as your beloved, blood-bought, redeemed, freed sons and daughters. We worship you, O oh God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. It is good to worship the Lord and to praise his name. And we continue to worship him with our tithes and offerings. But first of all, kids, you are free to go to your Kids Connection. It's great having you with us, sing the praises of the Lord. You are free to go to uh, your class, Kids Connection, at this time as we prepare to give of our offerings and gifts. And uh, once again, if you give electronically, um, you can virtually picture, I am giving my offering as this basket's going by. And uh, if you're a guest, feel no obligation to give, you're our guest. And so we're just delighted that you're here. Feel free, if you have a connection card, you can drop that in the basket. And as the church family knows, that second narrow, long, boat-like basket full of yellow cards, we want to restock our household necessity pantry. We had a giveaway yesterday. How many families did we have? Anyone? 70. 70. Over 70. So thanks be to God. <laughs> Praise God for that. So we need your help to restock for our next, next household necessity pantry giveaway. So I don't trip over my tongue here. And uh, with that said, I have a few announcements for you as the offering's being taken. We're going to have our movie, mission movie event next Sunday to the Ends of the Earth movie. So you're all warmly invited. This will be after service, showcasing the work of Mission Aviation Fellowship. We've had them speak here before and giving an update. And so we're going to have a fun Lakeshore family time, pizza, lunch, popcorn, and ice cream. How's that? I think I need to bless that so no calories count or something. <laughs> but hey, we're going to have a great time. If you, we'd love to have you stay. We need you. This is the final day. We need you to RSVP. We need you to let us know. Yes, I want to come so we know how much food to have. That would be great. Please stay. It's going to be a great time together. Also, you may notice there's construction work going on outside. That's our memorial prayer garden in process. And um, so that started. And anyone who would like to financially help or assist with that, that would be wonderful. Uh, gifts of $200 or more will have a custom plaque in memory of your loved one uh, as we remember those who died and are with the Lord. And we want to commemorate that and, and have a beautiful space to pray. And so you can direct your questions to Claire Bush, who's right here, where is he? or uh, Debbie Miller, or just the church office. All right, we have an opportunity for all those boxes of old documents that, what do I do with these? Now you can get rid of them. We have a shredding event. Wow, this is the first time I've been in a church where I've announced we're going to have a shredding event. I love it. One hour free shredding of that. Sounds kind of fun. It's like, man, how much can I shred? Uh, Friday, September 16th, noon to 1 p.m., free will donations to benefit our new memorial garden. And so bring all those old IRS, out-of-date documents, whatever, shred them. Get rid of them. You got to do that here. Uh, not, uh, noon to 1. Because once it's 1, they're going to go. So... Be here for that. And finally, no, not finally, but almost finally, we want to celebrate our Director of Worship and Arts, Mike Dorman, for 20 years of service. If you would <laughs> bless, encourage, thank him. So technically it's September 1st. I think we think that that's actually what it is. But it's 20 years. We'll say it's September 1st. And we want to celebrate. I mean, got to celebrate. And Sunday, August 28th, um, we're going to have an ice cream social in his honor. So look forward to that on the 28th as we celebrate his 20 years of service with us and uh, enjoy some ice cream and just thank God for the gifts uh, that he's poured out to us through him.
and all that he does here. And finally, if, if you are kind of new to Lakeshore and you're like, you know, I don't know, maybe I'm interested in making Lakeshore my church family, uh, or you're ready to take the step, or you want to know more. Your next step is to fill out an application for membership. There are uh, cards you can get at the Information Center, or if you email the office or mark it on your connection card, we'll make sure you get that. And you see, if you want to follow Jesus, to follow Jesus means to be committed to him, and it means to be committed to his family and a body of believers. And so you can fill out the application, schedule a meeting with me, and then you will complete a, I have a new kind of hybrid instruction path, a video-based discipleship essentials, and then a final uh, meeting or two with me. Um, so fill out, schedule, and complete. Even if you have questions, would love to meet with you. So with that said, let's prepare our hearts to hear God's word. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you have called us to yourself, that you are here, and we worship you. And we worship you now by hearing and honoring your word in Holy Scripture. Speak to us. Work in us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the text um, I've chosen for our message this morning deal with uh, the law, commands, the morality, the way of living that comes from God. And of course, that takes us back to the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 6, where Moses repeats to the people the Ten Commandments and all the other laws of God, and then he sums them up here in chapter 6, verses 1 to 9. He says, now this is the body of commands. And these are the statutes and the ordinances that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. So you may carry them out in the land to which you are crossing over to receive as a possession. So that you may fear the Lord your God by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I am commanding to you. As well as to your children and grandchildren all the days of your life. And so that your days may be long. Listen. O Israel, and be conscientious about doing those things, so it may go well for you, and you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. These words that I'm commanding you today are to be on your heart. Teach them diligently to your children. And speak about them when you sit in your house and when you walk on the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as a sign on your wrists and they will serve as symbols on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your houses and on your gates. This is the word of the Lord. And Paul talking about the commandments of God, says they're all summed up in one word, and that's love. In Romans chapter 13, 8 to 14, Paul says, do not owe anyone anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and if there is any other commandment, are summed up in this statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. So love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this since you understand the present time. It is already the hour for you to wake up from sleep. Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is almost over. And the day is drawing near. So let us put away the deeds of darkness and put on the weapons of light. Let us walk decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual sin and wild living, not in strife and jealousy. Instead, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not give any thought to satisfying the desires of your sinful flesh. The 
word of the Lord. And finally, the words of Jesus, where Jesus sums it all up for us. From Mark 12, 28 to 34, and this will serve as the basis for our message this morning. One of the experts in the law approached after he heard their discussion. And when he saw that Jesus had answered them well, he asked Jesus, which commandment is the greatest of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. The expert in the law said to him, well said, teacher, you have spoken correctly on the basis of the truth that he is one, and that there is no other besides him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbors yourself is more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. This is the word of the Lord. Please pray with me. Father God, we thank you for your word of truth. And Lord, in these times where people wonder if there is any truth, Lord, speak to us in a way, Lord, that we have assurance of knowing the truth that is in you. And through your word, that Jesus, we would look like you in all that we do. In your name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Now, unfortunately, there is a growing number of people in America who have a perception of Christianity that, on the one hand, it deals with this guy named Jesus, Jesus the Christ, and because of him, people get saved, and then they're separate from the world. But then the perception that there's this seemingly arbitrary set of moral laws and rules that Christians claim hypocritically to try to live by. And then they point a hateful finger of judgment and intolerance on others and say, you're a sinner. You're bad. You're going to hell. And the surveys bear it out. There's an increasing number of kind of the 18 to 40, 45 group um, that that's how they view Christianity. Christians are judgy people, hateful and intolerant. And, you know, it doesn't help when there are those who bear the name Christian who live up to that stereotype. I mean, when there are those who bear the name Christian, who are, who come across as hateful and judgmental and intolerant and bitter. And people are like, I don't want anything to do with you. Or when you have high-profile Christian pastors or leaders who say, I'm living for God. I'm living according to his word. And then the scandal breaks out. No, they're not. They're like, we told you so. You're a bunch of hypocrites. Or you have Christian groups or churches that the very tone of their message to the world is you're all a bunch of sinners and you're going to hell. And uh, a few years back there was the renowned Westboro Baptist Church in Westboro, Kansas. That most people, I don't know if you've heard of Westboro, uh, it's been a, been a few years back, but they, they would travel to events around the country and, and would protest with signs, you know, to various sinful events and sinful people, uh, and, and signs that said, you know, repent, God hates you, you're going to hell. Well, that's a way to win people to Jesus, not. And that's a perception that young woman named Rachel Gilson had. She shares her story in Christianity Today. She grew up in San Francisco, California. Non-Christian, not religious family. Um, 
her parents, I mean, it was a very open marriage and no strong sense of morality at all. And, and so she grew up just thinking, you know, it's whatever feels good. And when she was 14, she dated a boy and then didn't last long. And then when she was 15, there was a, a senior girl that she really, really, it's like, oh, I really like her. And they were both taking AP European history and she needed help. And so she got to help her with her homework and, and realized, oh my goodness, I, I think I love her. And realized that she had feelings for this senior girl the way girls normally have for boys. And then when she was 16, because they'd gotten to know each other, and the senior girl um, for uh, Rachel's birthday asked her, so what do you want for your birthday? And she said, well, I want you to kiss me. And uh, well, one thing led to another. She kissed her, had a relationship. She began to identify herself as a lesbian. This is who I am. And she went to Yale University, very studious, young girl, young woman. And uh, she'd hear about Christians in the church, and, and her perception was, oh, they just have these arbitrary set of rules. They're hateful and intolerant, and why in the world? She couldn't figure it out, you know, boxing people in. And, and so this gets to a very significant objection that we face today that is very emotional, that is wired, in, more and more getting wired into our culture. Isn't Christian morality hateful and intolerant? And we're going to bump up against it more and more. We are. And, and sometimes we don't know if we can say anything. We may feel like, I just need to be quiet. Or I'm going to be accused of hate speech. Well, Rachel felt this way. Objected to Christianity. It's, it's hateful. It's intolerant until she read the Bible and she met Jesus. So I want us to look at the Gospel of Mark. As we consider in this day and age where Christian morality can be called hate speech and we can be shut off, canceled, how do we respond? When we look at Mark 12, this is the week Jesus is in Jerusalem, the week he's going to be betrayed, suffer, and die. And he's been in discussions with various Jewish religious leaders. The Pharisees came to him, then the Sadducees. And, and now a, a Jewish scholar, an expert in the law, comes to Jesus, approaches him, having heard, wow, he, he really knows how to field these questions. And he comes to Jesus, and he has a question. Which commandment is the greatest of all? Now, the assumptions behind his question is that there is an absolute moral law code. And that this absolute moral law code of what's right and what's wrong comes from God. And, and this moral law code that comes from God has various laws and commandments. And he's like, okay, of all of these laws that come from God... Which one is the greatest? Now, this question, which commandment is the greatest of all? Most people today, it's like, that's completely incoherent. Doesn't make any sense to us because Bible's a man-made book. This is just man-made stuff. Why would that have any absolute universal value whatsoever? Really, the question that people today would ask Jesus is this. Well... And you should have gotten a, some sermon notes today. Decided, hey, I think these are kind of helpful. Maybe I'll pass these out. The question people would ask today instead would be, well, is there really any moral command or law that is absolute and applies to everyone? Besides, isn't morality relative to what your truth is? Haven't you heard that? It's your truth. I've got my truth. Well, first of all, we need some clear Christian common sense. Just basic common sense, first of all, not to mention Christian. And then using the mind God gave us, 
first of all, we need to look at that claim and realize, actually, it's not the Christian claim that is incoherent. It is this claim that is incoherent. So that, but first of all, I have on your sheet the first point. How can anyone say that they know that there are no moral absolutes? You might be puzzled by that question, but I want you to really think about it. How can anyone even make that claim, well, I know definitively that there are no, no moral absolutes? This is kind of akin to when we talked about science. If an atheistic scientist says, well, I know because of science that there is no God. Sorry, logical fallacy. You can't make that claim. Science deals with physics. Religion is metaphysics. That's a different category. And besides, you would have to have all knowledge of everything beyond the natural to say that there is no God. So also with morality. Morality, an absolute moral standard, transcends particular human beings. Does anyone have definitive, exhaustive knowledge that there is no morality? Moral, absolute? No one can make that claim. In fact, to make the claim that it's all relative, moral relativism is actually incoherent. And it's inconsistent. It's incoherent because, well, there is absolutely no moral absolutes. Are you absolutely sure about that? Exactly. It, it's an inner inconsistency. It's like you can't make an absolute claim contradicting your very claim. But, but you see, there is like a moral, there is like a spiritual collective madness that has gripped our nation, that pervades our entertainment, that pervades business, all levels of society. And we're not even to the Bible yet. We're just talking about clear, rational, logical thinking. There, there's a collective madness that has taken hold of people and our culture. They're not even thinking clear. This is incoherent. There is absolutely no moral absolutes. You just made a moral claim. Absolutely. And you contradicted yourself. You can't do that. And it's also inconsistent because these people are like, well, do whatever you want. And yet, they only say that for the things that they just want to do whatever they want to do. Because then over here, they do live by moral absolutes. If it comes to climate change or going green or being... You know, environmentally friendly or the woke identity politics agenda or LGBTQ or any of the agendas in our culture right now, it becomes very morally absolute and so dogmatic. You want to talk about hateful and intolerant? So hateful and intolerant to anyone who dissents or disagrees, you're canceled. That's what's fueling our current cancel culture. A moral, absolute dogmatism cloaked in the sense of tolerance and relativity. But see, it cherry picks. This is the incoherent inconsistency. And it is more dogmatic, more judgmental than, well, than what Christianity is. Yeah, you know, I, I told you a story, and I'll just recap. When I took a philosophy of religion in college, and this gets to our third point, if morality was relative to personal desire, because it's like, well, it's whatever you want, whatever I want, your truth, my truth, then there would be no objective good and evil. And so in this philosophy of religion class, as I mentioned two weeks ago, you know, this young lady said, well, there is no God, there is no good and evil. And the, the guy, another guy in class trying to trap her said, well, what if someone raped you? And she paused. And everyone was shocked that she was so consistent with her philosophy. She said, well, I can't say that it would be evil, wrong, or bad. But I wouldn't like it. And it's like, you can't sustain that. What, what about murder? You know, what, what about the abuse of children? What about human trafficking? See, you get to a point where intuitively we all know there is a real objective evil in the world. There must be a real objective good. 
Moral relativism does not work. And I, one illustration that just Christian philosopher J.P. Moreland, someone's writing about this, just great. He has an encounter with a, uh, a student and a, at University of Vermont, and he's speaking to him in a dorm, in the student's dorm, and he told him, the student told the Moreland, he said, well, whatever is true for you is true for you, and whatever is true for me is true for me. If something works for you because you believe it, that's great, but no one should force his or her views on other people since everything is relative. As Moreland left, he unplugged the student's stereo and started to walk out the door with it. And the student protested, hey, what are you doing? You can't do that. And Moreland replied, well, you're not going to force on me the belief that it's wrong to steal your stereo, are you? He then went on to point out to the student that when it's convenient, people say they don't care about sexual morality or cheating on exams, but they become moral absolutists in a hurry when someone steals their things or violates their rights. That is, they are selective moral relativists, which doesn't work. Interestingly, a few weeks later, because it so crashed in on him, he became a follower of Jesus. Because he recognized the connection between God and human dignity and rights, and that God made us in his image. And so, Moreland says, I like to tell churches that this could be a great new evangelistic method called stealing stereos for Jesus. <laughs> There's an objective good, and that good is rooted in God. You see, the source for moral absolutes has to be an absolutely good, transcendent, personal being. If it's not absolutely good, if it's mixed with evil or badness, it, it, you, it's no good standard. It has to transcend a particular person or people or group or nation. Otherwise, it's relative to that person, group, or nation. It has to be an absolutely good, transcendent, personal being. It can't come from mere atoms. It can't come from a rock. It can't come from a mountain or stars because morality is personal. It's about relationship. Inanimate objects don't have personal relationships. And the only one who fits this bill, the only coherent foundation for moral absolutes is God himself. And see, this is the first answer that Jesus gives. What is the greatest commandment? And Jesus says the most important is, he starts with a confession. The Shema, as it was called, Hebrew for hear. The great confession of Israel that they would repeat every single day, morning and evening. Hear, O Israel, the Lord. And in Hebrew, it's Yahweh, the one who is the transcendent one who transcends all of creation. He's our God. He's the ultimate, almighty, all-powerful, all-wise, all-just, everywhere present one who transcends creation, who made it all. He's the source of our life and the very source of goodness itself. And the Lord is one. That means there is no other source, no other center. He is to be the center. The very definition of what goodness and life is. So that it's not arbitrary. God's moral will and laws are not arbitrarily made up by a will, a whim of his will. It flows out of who he is. It's not relative. So the importance of having one transcendent, one who is over us, the master of our lives, to set the absolute standard. Great story that illustrates this. Skydiving. First of all, I would never do it. I have a fear of heights. Just the thought of it. So if you go skydiving as the story is told, Southwest Florida Skydiving Club in Punta Gorda, Florida, 
in their brochure, it says you can count on two things. One, an exciting experience. No, it would be terrifying. Wouldn't do it. Two, the need to follow some basic rules. For instance, so the guy who owns the place set the rules. For instance, before you participate in a dive, you're jump master. The one who is the master of skydiving, who is your master for doing the skydiving, sets the rules. He'll give you the following instructions. Don't curl up into the fetal position. You can slip out of your harness. That would be bad. Arch, don't, uh, arch your back and hold your arms out in front of you to keep you from slipping out of your harness and to get you flying in the correct position. Stick your legs out in front when landing. No explanation necessary. Do everything your jump master tells you to do immediately. No pets allowed on your jump. <laughs> That's just stupid. It says these are non-negotiables, especially if you want to live. And they are absolutes. And the guy writing on this says, now let's imagine another skydiving experience when you arrive at a smiling instructor, he begins strapping a parachute to your back while walking you toward a plane idling just outside. And over the plane's engine noise, the instructor yells, we're here at the relativist skydiving school. We believe there are many ways to get from the plane to the ground. We respect everyone's desire to skydive, and we don't believe in absolute rules. Just listen to your inner voice, respond honestly to your feelings, and have a memorable experience. We'll see you when you get down. <laughs> Splat. If that was your experience, would you go skydiving? Absolutely. I'm not, I wouldn't go skydiving if you had rules. Most people who go skydiving are glad that there are strict, non-negotiable rules. You can't be a relativist at skydiving. The rules are there for good reason. When we know why the rules are there, it helps us embrace them. It's for your good. It's to save you. It's for your life. It's the same with the moral absolute law. It flows from God, who is good, who is life. And so that means that our hearts, our lives are to be devoted to the God who is goodness and life. They're not arbitrary rules, but he who is goodness and he who is life, these flow from him as an expression of this is his design of what it means to live. Problem is, this is what we call sin. When we rebel against God, when we turn away from him and say, no, I don't want to listen to the jump master of my life. I want to follow the desires of my heart. Because of sin, the desires of our heart become disordered. And we deceive ourselves um, by devoting our life to those desires. Twisted, disordered though they are, thinking we're going to find happiness. So once Jesus has made clear that God is our source, God is the source of goodness and life, and, and, and the law, the, the commandments are an expression of that goodness and life, he then says, what's the greatest commandment? He starts off with what's in Deuteronomy 6. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. That we're to be devoted to him because he's the source of our goodness in life. And notice that with all of our heart, the desires of our hearts are to be devoted to him because he knows what is good for us. But we wrestle with sin, disordered desires, or what scripture calls the sinful desires of the heart or the lusts of the flesh. Where we turn away from the God who is goodness in life to follow our own self-centered desires. Or we say, well, I'll be the jump master. I'll figure it out. Or you know what? I don't care. I'll steal stereos. But he is goodness. He is life. And when we turn away, when we follow, the, make our desires authoritative it ends in destruction, in misery and death. We know flowing from this, 
is also, Jesus adds another commandment. Love God. This scholar, Jewish scholar, asks for one commandment. Jesus gives two. Because flowing out of the commandment to be devoted to God, that he be first in our lives because he's the source of our life. He is pure, ultimate, absolute goodness. And all the commands and laws are expressions of what it means to be blessed and have life and live in goodness. He also says flowing out of that is a second. And he quotes from Leviticus 19.18. The second is like this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And as I have there is the point, as our good life-giving God, he commands us to be devoted in love to others. It's about loving, service, and compassion, and relationship. But this is key. In the ways that God says are good and life-giving. We don't define what love is. We don't define what it means for there to be a good, thriving, life-giving relationship with others. God defines that. Which is, Paul in Romans says, well, consider the commandments. They're all summed up as love. And the first three shall have no other God, not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. That's our relationship with God. We're to love him, be devoted to him. And then the subsequent seven is our relationship with one another. Honor your father and mother and other authorities. You shall not murder or harm or hurt anyone in word or deed. You shall not commit adultery, marriage, and sex. You shall not steal or strive to get other people's things or even stereos. Eight, you shall not give false testimony against someone else. Don't lie, don't slander, don't tear someone down, ruining their good name. And then the final two are, do not greedily covet and seek to get more stuff, especially that you see your neighbor has, thinking that's going to make me happy. But you know, the one that's causing all the controversy today is the sixth commandment. You, sh- you shall not commit adultery. The place of gender, how you define gender, marriage, and sex. And, and there's a lot we could say about this, but I just want to frame it now in the words of Jesus. But from the beginning, and this is in Mark 10 couple chapters prior, but from the beginning of creation, God made the male and female. Now, he makes very clear, I made them male and female. Now, we in our disordered desires, we may struggle with who we are and maybe even struggling with our gender, and yet here we have the truth, I made them male and female. And yes, it is true, there's a very small percentage that are born where it's not clear what gender they are, and, you know, and, that, and that's part of the broken, disordered fallenness of our creation. And yes, we're all in the same boat. We're all sinners who struggle with disordered desires. But here stands the truth of God. I made them male and female. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. That God has given marriage between one man and one woman And that sexual intimacy, being joined together in the one flesh union, is a gift that he gives only in marriage between one man and one woman. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. And yet from that comes every other relationship. God blesses us with many relationships. You know, relationships with siblings and brothers and sisters. That men having a close, loving friendship with other men that are non-sexual. Women having close, intimate, loving Friendships and relationships with other women that are non-sexual. God gives all kinds of relationships, but he puts boundaries on them. And he says right here, this is what he's given between a man and a woman. Because it's for our good. And and just one point on this before moving on. Because, once again, I have to abbreviate this. There's a lot that could be covered. 
And we just think, oh, well, sex doesn't have to be coupled with marriage and man and woman and children. All this can be pulled apart. So a study was done by a sociological researcher called The End of Sex, How Hookup Culture is Leaving a Generation Unhappy, Sexually Unfulfilled, and Confused About Intimacy. It said, what all this has done, unhappiness, misery, depression, suicidal ideation, it doesn't lead to happiness. People, well, if I just follow my desires and my heart, I'll be happy. No, you won't. No, you won't. As Jesus makes very clear, yes, we're to love our neighbors as we love ourselves, but in the way that God defines it. Because that's good, and it's life-giving. Now, the expert in the law, when he hears Jesus' answer, he's like, oh, wow, you're Teacher, you got it. You nailed it right. You know, we're to put God first, love him. We're to love others. And uh, there's nothing, this is more important than burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now, Jesus wasn't the first to pair these together. There were other Jewish rabbis who did. So Jesus was affirming love for God, love for others. It's all about the love that God defines. And so when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. In other words, you understand this is how the rule and reign of God works and operates. This is what it looks like. But you're not there. You're not in it. You're not experiencing it. Because the law, yes, it shows us God's design. It shows us how we are to live in relationship with God and one another. But it alone does not have the power to get us there. And we in and of ourselves, not by any of our efforts, can correct or change the desires of our hearts. We cannot get ourselves into, back into a relationship with God. The law just convicts us all as sinners. And I have to make this clear. We're all sinners. We're all in the same boat. We all struggle with the same disordered desires. No sin is worse than another. And we have no room to point a finger in judgment on others as if we're better than anyone else. Can you get an amen? We are equally condemned as sinners in need of the mercy of God. Because he is love itself. He is goodness. He is life. He is love itself. And it is only the forgiving love of God in Christ Jesus. When it gets a hold of our hearts, that he forgives us. When we trust in Jesus and believe in him, he cleanses us and gives us a new heart with new desires that desire to love God, that desire to show compassion, to live good, compassionate lives of service for all people, not excluding anyone. The Apostle John makes it clear. He says, this is how God how his love was revealed for us. That he sent his only begotten son into the world. That means for all people. No one's excluded. This is for all people so that we may live through him. His redeeming, self-giving, sacrificial love. When the father sent his only begotten son to take our place. To take our fall. All of our disordered desires, the mess we've made, our death, our destruction. And to take our place and die and give himself for us. To remake us. To renew us. That when we trust in him, we're transformed. We're changed. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And that once we've received that, now we have new hearts by the Holy Spirit that desire to love with a Jesus kind of love. Not being hateful or intolerant. Yes, hating sin. Because we're sinners. But loving all people. And then John I didn't get all the verses in there. But uh, God is love. Whoever remains in love remains in God and God in him. We love because he first loved us. If you'll permit me a couple minutes, I know I'm going a little over, but this message is so significant. So Rachel, was at Yale College, had a girlfriend, 
And then her girlfriend breaks up with her and goes with a guy. Rachel's very smart, intelligent. She's in a philosophy class. Learned about Descartes. I think, therefore I am. And then how he reasoned from this to God's existence. And she's wondering, well, could God exist? I don't know. And then she meets a, a friend, fellow student, who uh, studying to be a liberal Lutheran pastor. And she's like, oh, well, you know, it's okay to mix, you know, being a lesbian and Christianity together and, and gave her a booklet about, you know, this is how you make it all work. And she went back to her dorm and she read it and she looked up the Bible passages and she's like, no, this doesn't work. This isn't what this book says. And, and she's really wondering and questioning. And, and then she's in another friend's dorm, a lapsed Catholic, and notices a book, orange-bound book called uh, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. And when her friend's not looking, she p takes it, puts it in her bag. <laughs> and, and when she's reading it, she's just as convicted by the Spirit as laying out all the arguments. That there is moral absolutes, a good and an evil, and that's rooted in a good, loving God. And that good and loving God is seen in the person of Jesus. And it so washes over her and overwhelms her that, that she surrenders her life and faith to Jesus. She tells this story in Christianity Today. And now she's in love with Jesus, and yet she's struggling with these desires. She still likes women. God didn't just magically take it away. And so she, she knew that her love for Jesus, because of his love for her, was greater than anyone else's love. But now sure was a battle. And so as Paul says, you know, it, it's a continual putting on of Jesus. Clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. She had to renew herself in her identity. Her identity was not her desires. It was not her feelings. But it was what was given to her in her baptism. She was marked with the name of God. Just like you were. That you are an adopted, blood-bought child of the Heavenly Father. That is your identity. And she had to renew herself in her Jesus identity day and day and day after day. And there were relapses. Oh, intimate with some women. Now following Jesus until God brought a man into her life. And um, she'd been married over 10 years. And she'll admit, she still at times struggles, as every married couple does, with temptations and feelings. But she's remained faithful to him, knowing who God is and his love for her. Because following Jesus is the reason. It's the love of God. And that is for our good. And it's to want the good for others. I want to close with one more. And this is so important. Another woman who uh, had been a professor at University of Syracuse. And she describes that she was a comfortable committed lesbian until she had what she described as a train wreck conversion to Christ. She wrote, as an unbelieving professor of English, an advocate of postmodernism, and an opponent of an all totalitized, totalizing meta-narrative, sounds like a professor, like Christianity, I would have added back in the day, I found peace and purpose in my life as a lesbian and the queer community I helped to create until it all came crashing down. And she met Jesus. She says, today she's married to Pastor Kent Butterfield, pastor, and mother of four adopted children and numerous foster children. And as the story is shared, it says, after her conversion, she describes an encounter with a female counselor who wanted um, Dr. Butterfield to bend her message about homosexual practice. The woman asked Butterfield to state publicly that homosexual practice is not inherently wrong. And I want you to listen to what she wrote. When I entered um, her office, she directed me to a comfortable chair and made one simple request. Rosario, I want you to change your message. I found this a bold and dis disarming request, and so I told her that I come in the gospel of peace. 
She said, change your message. Finally, I asked her what I ought to change in my message. She said, tell people that it is only in your opinion that homosexual practice is sin. I responded by letting her know that I'm not smart enough to have this opinion, but that this is the position the inspired and inerrant word of God upholds. It comes to me from the historic Christian church, through the pages of scripture, and so on down to me. And I told her that changing my message would involve denying the plain message of scripture, the testimony of the church, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and the gospel. But to the postmodern mind, her request seemed reasonable enough. Just own this position of mine as a personal point of view. But claiming something that is a universal truth to be a mere matter of, matter of personal preference is a lie by omission. This is the Bible's message. And apart from Christ, I am more condemned by it than the woman who made this request. But she knew the forgiveness of Jesus. And it's the same with us. We all stand equally sinful and condemned for our disordered desires, whatever they are. And yet God has loved us in Christ. He forgives us. He makes us his own. And he gives us a new heart by faith to begin to love him and love others, even